Uh, thanks for the invitation to, to come speak with you today. Um, uh, I do. Uh, I'm, I'm a lab guy. I've been a lab guy at <clears throat> FDA for quite a long time and have done all kinds of different studies related to, to food packaging. And uh, I'll try to highlight some of those things that we've done over the years and, and some of the pitfalls in actually um, uh, doing uh, analyses. So the challenges for analyzing food contact materials, they're pretty significant, actually. When you think about it, uh, people like to make stuff to, to hold their food, and they want it to be indestructible. So now you take an indestructible thing and you bring it into lab, and we have to figure out, well, what's in it? That, that's not such an easy job. Uh, you know, the, the manufacturers design these things not to dissolve. I mean, there are some things that dissolve. You know, polystyrenes, actually PET, you can dissolve it with some exo exotic solvents. Uh, but uh, in, in the most part, these things are, are not easy to work with. And so we also have really no standard methods of analysis, believe it or not. Uh, everyone is allowed to their own devices to do any type of measurement they'd like. Uh, there are some uh, standard, there are no standard reference materials that you would find at NIST so someone can actually be proficiently tested to see if they can actually do the analysis correctly. About 10, no, it's actually more than 10 years ago, that's about 2002 maybe, uh, there was a, a project in Europe where they actually made some uh, certified reference materials to help people actually be able to qualify their labs to be able to do these analysis correctly. Uh, those standards, there's probably about six of them and they're, I think they're still stored at the Fraunhofer Institute in Freising, Germany. And that was a quite a nice project, um, but they are very limited. There's some antioxidants, some monomers that are in these materials, and you can see if you can analyze them and, and come up with the, the desired result. <clears throat> and there's also, um, in a lot of cases, when you think about it, uh, there are actually no analytical standards that you can buy to actually say that this is really it. Uh, from an analytical chemistry point, that, that, that's, that's a problem. Uh, but we have some newer tools these days, which I'm going to go over, which, which helps to elucidate, is it really the thing you think it is? So, and, and the experimental design for carrying out migration tests, I mean, we saw the, uh, Greg, the last speaker, showed some design of some, ex of some migration cells, but there's a huge array of different things. People do them all different ways, and so we have no real standard, you know, experimental design for actually doing a migration test. So there's a lot of variability in that. So, uh, you know, uh, Kirk also uh, pointed out that we have this document uh, for the recommendations for doing these tests. It has lots of prescriptions in there for time and temperature, for how to hold your materials. It doesn't tell you too much about the true analytical things on how to get the correct results. But they have a lot of different, uh, you know, prescriptions in there, how to comply and submit data for the FCM process. And one of the sections there is, is, is listed here, and it says basically you have to tell us anything and everything that's in your food contact material. That's a pretty tall order, given that there's not one analytical method that can answer this question. And when it comes to the uh, byproducts and degradation products, a lot of these, like I uh, already um, explained, there are no standards. You know, they're just not there. So how do you know that this thing that reacts is truly what you think it is? And, and that's, uh, that's a pretty significant challenge. So uh, basically a lot of the work that people do when they analyze food contact materials, uh, they're the analysis of unknowns, or there's a newer term they use these days is an untargeted analysis. That means that you have no idea what you're looking for, but you throw a huge battery of analytical tests to it, and uh, you, you try to determine what's there. So uh, what's really important uh, for us to do? Uh, how, do we, how do we start out? Well, you know, this equation is a solution to fixed law. It's not, not necessarily something that's easy to talk about, uh, but it, it actually does work. Um, and if you know how to apply it, you can actually determine what might migrate into food. And that's MT. That's the most important thing that Kirk needs to know so he can get an exposure estimate so Jason can say this is okay to eat this stuff. Uh, but it, you can actually have a simpler arrangement, and, and it's, this is just a simpler equation, which is a lot easier to talk about. And it, it indicates that the C0 here, is, is there, a, where's the pointer? How do, how do we work the pointer? Uh, is it, 
is your pointer here? Okay. Is this thing work? How's this? Okay. Right, I'll see. Okay. Well, C0 is, is, is the thing that we must determine. Uh, it's the initial concentration that is in the packaging material. Actually, there's many of them that are in something. And as you can see, it, the MT is what is, ends up in the food. And so whatever's in your package is directly proportional to what ends up in the food. And you can just multiply it by some diffusion coefficient, which is, is quite simple. So, so actually, when we do things in the lab, the first thing I tell my newer folks is take a pencil paper, scribble down, and say, let's design an experiment to see if something ends up in the food. We first have to determine what C0 is, and then we do a, we can, you can get a rough calculation of what the diffusion coefficient. There are lots of models for doing that. You know, you, as long as you're in the ballpark, you know, it's, it, it works pretty well. And that'll tell you exactly what would be in the food. And if you don't measure it, you have to ask yourself, what did you do wrong? Uh, and, and that's uh, because we have so much experience that when you set these things up right, actually they, they all work. And they actually um, follow the mass transfer um, formulas. And there are many of them. Uh, but so when you get into some very sophisticated things like dry foods and things like that, you have to do some, use some different expressions. But anyway, so um, what we don't want for, uh, well, one thing, you know, for turning zero to zero, C0 is, you know, can we get a, a false positive? That's not so bad. That's just free data for FDA saying that, that we get free tox data on something that's really not in your package. So that, that, that's not really that bad, but, you know, we can, we can live with that. But... We can't really live with a false negative. I mean, that, that, that's just something that we, we don't, really don't want, uh, and no one wants that. Uh, historically, has that ever happened? Yes, uh, and the most notorious, of course, is perfluoroctanoic acid. This is quite interesting, actually. Um, uh, it ended up in, it was in these lots of formulations, and it was there for a real long time, and no one knew it, mainly because when these things were first approved, the instrumentation at those times was pretty bad. You just couldn't measure it. But let's just look at the history of this thing. W what actually happened? These things were approved uh, initially back in 67 and 74, and there are many approved later. And if you look at our guidance documents, uh, PERFOA is not in any of them. I mean, they don't, it's not an ingredient, it's not a reaction product, it does, it's not used to make any of this stuff. But it truly was there for a long, long time. And, and we, couldn't, we couldn't really measure it. Uh, and so what happened? Uh, in, in, in 99, 3M found out that through occu occupational exposure, uh, their, their employees had uh, perfluoroctanoic acid and, and PFOS. PFOS is a degradation product of, of the product that 3M made. It was used for paper coating. And so um, and in 2002, they decided to withdraw that from the market. And so, you know, we, we were, we do, uh, actually, we were involved in <clears throat> perfluoro paper coatings for a, actually, quite a long time. Uh, in, in, after 3M got out of the business, we decided to look at what would happen. And I actually worked on these perfluoro chemicals back in the late 80s because we had the issue of the microwave popcorn susceptors. And in order to get these bags to work, they coat them with perfluoro chemicals. And they put quite a bit on them. And microwave popcorn bags, actually, when you heat them in the oven, microwave oven, they go to 220 C in a really short time. And so what happens to these coatings when you put them at 220 C in a microwave popcorn bag? Well, back in, in the late 80s, we, it, we tried to measure it, and, and it, it just wasn't easy to do because the instrumentation really wasn't there. Uh, but anyway, when we looked at the archive sample from 87 uh, in 2003, uh, it had PFOA in it. And it had a fair amount, uh, 100 parts per million. That's not considered really trace these days. I mean, you know, they, they, you know it's parts per trillion now people are getting, these consumer agencies are getting like jittery about. Uh, but it truly was there. And every single paper coating that was on the market in the United States actually had PFOA in it. And we didn't know it till 
you know, 2003. So actually, what do we have at our, <coughs> our disposal today to actually look at things? Uh, there, there are many, um, uh, you know, we, ha we can divide things up into two, two categories. There's some volatiles, semi-volatiles, and non-volatiles. You know, uh, GC with an FID detector has been the, you know, that's just been the, the workhorse over all the years. The problem is that FID is a nonspecific detector, and you still need a standard to, do, to be able to identify an unknown. Uh, an ECD detector with a GC, that's good for halogens. That would have been great for PFOA, but the problem is you can't get PFOA through a GC. And the only way you can get it through a GC is to derivatize it. Well, if you don't know what you're derivatizing, you can't get it through a GC. So that wouldn't work either. The MSD, uh, which is also, they've become quite sensitive these days. <clears throat> they have great libraries for the MSDs, GC MSDs, uh, the NIST libraries. Uh, but if your standard, if your material is not in the NIST library, you're out of luck. You can't identify it. And the problem with the MSD is that's uh, uh, 70 electron volts, and it just blasts the molecules apart, and you tend not to get a molecular line. So in an unknown, it's not so easy to really tell what it really is, unless you get a match by the uh, library of NIST. Now we have the, the uh, GC with the, the high res, or ac what we call accurate mass. This is, this is a really nice uh, development over the last, eh, actually their bench top, we have quite a, a number of them now, over the last five years or so they've become more, more mainstream. I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. <clears throat> but, uh, and here you get an accurate mass and you get, get a molecular weight because you use chemical ionization. Usually methane is used in the GC to get a high res. Uh, you also have headspace, uh, thermal desorption, and, and uh, uh, vape, uh, vape, uh, vacuum distillation. Those are different techniques of which you can administer your sample into a GCMS. And then, of course, you can use it an MSD, an ECD, or an accurate mass. So these are different sample preparation techniques. That's provided you were somehow able to extract your package efficiently and get the material out of the package and get it into the instrument. On the non-volatile side, uh, a refractive index detector with a, with a LC is not very useful. That's usually mainly using something like drugs where you have bulk materials. Uh, UV detectors these days are quite, quite sensitive, actually. They, 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 they work quite well, but still you need standards for those things. You have to have a chromophore. Fluorescent detector, on a, uh, you, know, you also have to have a fluorophore there, and you need a standard. So they're not so good for determining unknowns. An evaporative light scattering detector, this is quite good for, for oligomers that, might, that you might extract from your polymer because it, 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 the light scattering requires a larger molecular size to be able to see it. A, um, a uh, corona, um, uh, the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the air, uh, charge aerosol detector. Uh, this is also a nonspecific detector, which is good for determining things that, that do not absorb UV light. Um, SFC, supercritical fluid chromatography, you can use that, but that tends to be limited on a sample injection size, so people really don't use it. Mostly SFC is used for um, the in, in, used in um, pharmaceutical for extraction purposes and processing. Uh, your HPLC with the MS, that's very powerful these days. Uh, they're essentially, uh, most labs t today usually have the uh, MS detectors in the lab, uh, and, and they are quite good. The problem with the, with the LCMS is if you don't get an ion, you get a perfectly flat baseline and nothing is detected. So you have to work actually to ionize your materials to get them to the mass spectrometer. And that's the same, it's the same case for the high res <coughs> uh, mass spectrometer. So uh, the, 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 none of these techniques actually work if you don't do, for the analysis of proof packaging, if you don't do a proper <coughs> chromatographic uh, axis calibration. If you don't do that, then you, you really don't know if you're missing something that's in your material. And Connie Grove was actually quite interested in this many, many years ago. I mean, the, it, when the capillary GC was coming out, and, and were people really measuring what they think they're measuring? And so, what were, so these are the two uh, publications that he had about, you know, doing some testing and, and using uh, actually capillary GC for analysis of, of unknowns. 
And so the, the initial thing is, does your analyte actually get through the injection system? Well, that's a pretty significant thing. People think, you know, you make an injection and it comes out. Well, it really doesn't, unless you really test it. You know, things go wrong in the injector of a GC. Actually, you can get quite a few false positives because things change at those very high temperatures in the GC injector, and you get something that comes out that really wasn't there. A classic example that we've run into over the years doing a bunch of kava analysis, everything had uh, biphenyl in it. And that was because this stuff was getting generated. Biphenyl is a fungicide, not allowed to be there. And, every, and all of our samples are coming up positive with biophenyl. It's not allowed to be there. It's a pesticide. And, and it, was being inject, it, it was being produced in the injector on the analysis of kava. So, so you have to be quite careful. You know, the GC injectors are not inert places. And then so does the analyte elute. That, that's, um, uh, you know, a, a very critical thing. People uh, make that assumption that you inject it, it comes out. Well, it, it not, doesn't necessarily do that. And then are they all chromatographically resolved? That's quite important. And so um, th this is actually the list of, of, this is the original list that, that Connie Grove came up with to actually just test a GC. There are C10, C11, C12 uh, hydrocarbons that are in there. There's a diol in there. There's some amines. Uh, there's some phenols. And there's some aldehydes. And you know that you need to get these through your GC to prove that you're actually measuring all these things that might be in a food contact material. And then when you go to higher molecular weight things, these you can use a C18 like octadecane or squalane for larger molecular weight things that you may need to get through a GC. So you actually might have to use larger molecular weight things to actually prove that what is in your package is really there. For uh, HPLC, it's, you don't need as many things to calibrate your access. Terephthalic acid is, uh, is a diacid uh, that's um, it's very polar. So that, that'll, that's one end of your chromatographic access. And then something like Ergonox 1076 or uh, Tristanol phenophosphite, uh, those are quite common. Uh, they take quite a bit of effort to get off an HPLC column. And so if you get them off, pretty much you have your whole range of things that are most likely to come out of a column uh, have, have come out. And have we actually turned down FCNs because they can't quite calibrate their chromatographic access? That's happened, actually. There have been things when people have not said, they said things come out, they didn't do their calibration access correctly, so they can't prove that what is there is really there. So, and I, I spoke earlier about the, the accurate mass uh, detectors. Uh, these are, are, are really pretty revolutionary for us in the food contact notification type of business. And they come in two forms. Basically, you have a, a, a time of flight instrument and, and an orbi trap. Uh, an orbital trap is, that's by thermo. That's their proprietary material. And these, mater these detectors have a, an extremely high resolution you know, greater than 10,000, and they go up to over 100,000. And they actually have a very high mass accuracy. So if you take something like uh, um, I'm thinking not, not BPA, um, BHT, the, the antioxidant BHT, that has a molecular weight about uh, 220. Uh, if you run it through one of these things, we know that to, you know, that precision in the mass access, which is incredible. And what does that actually do for us? If you have a mass accuracy of that, now you can generate the molecular formula of your unknowns. That is very powerful. You know, this is, this is quite powerful for us. And so now you can say, you, you set up a, a, one of these accurate mass things, you can have it sit at some mass and you can run through for they want to do these infraforming things, we've actually done it. Um, we've actually did some um, extracts of, of infant formula. We wanted to know, you know, PFO has been everywhere. Is there any in there? We set the accurate mass spectrometer sitting at that mass and scan all those things, and you find out that it doesn't show up, which is, is, is incredibly powerful. So let's, uh, and so we actually developed a, uh, at FDA, we actually developed a, a document to, confirm the identity of things. This is the name of the document. It's available, publicly available. And basically it says is that you need a, a mass accuracy of less than about three parts per million to, to really generate molecular formulas for unknown analysis. 
So um, let's take an example of this. Uh, let's look at some, some can cuttings and see what, it, what this can do for us. This is two minutes? Oh boy, I gotta hustle up. Um, okay, so this, everyone knows the stigma of B BPA, what it's done. It, it's, it's created some uh, new can coatings and we have to analyze them. The problem is our guidance document for looking at can coatings uh, isn't great for having lots of monomers to react together to, you know, and being able to analyze them. And additionally, the, our guidance document never envisions someone uh, testing, doing a migration test for extended periods of time. So again, we have to determine what C0 is for, for, for these uh, can coatings. Can coatings look like this. There's basically for polyesters, this is one of the things they want to use to replace the uh, epoxy phenol coatings. You take uh, an acid and a polyol and you get you know, a, a product and these can form, you can take a couple different acids, a couple polyols, and you get very complicated structure of polyesters. And there are no standards of these available. So how do we know what's really there? And they can also cyclize, perform these things. And so what they typically use, they use terephthalic acid, isothalic acid, acetonetic acid, and a bunch of diols. They put it all together, react it all together, and you get a mess. And so this is what it actually looks like. If you take an acetonitrile extract, and uh, this is on a high resolution mass spectrometer, this is what you get. And, and so Kirk needs to know what all those things are. This is a problem. And Jason wants to know all these things are. Real problem. But with, a, with an accurate mass thing, this is what you can do. This is quite interesting. Here, here's an example of, of a polyester can coating. So first, we've got to have a retention time. It's, it's somewhere on that previous slide. We have an accurate mass here, you know, and we know it all the way down to there. That accurate mass produces that molecular formula, which is beautiful because we know and when we use the, the, the monomers to put together, we can say that it has, or well, the difference between this formula and this accurate mass is this part per million. So now we know that we can actually generate something that we think is real. We can look at all our different monomers here and we can say, ah, it has a formula of exactly that. And in that chromatogram, only one peak had a formula of this, and it was a linear structure. If we go to the other end of the chromatogram, we have at the high end, we have something like this. We have an accurate mass. We get a molecular formula. The difference between this and that mass is one part per million. And we can construct, based on all the monomers, we can construct how they're all put together, which is great. And in this particular case, there are four peaks that actually have this cyclic arrangement of monomers. Now, the monomers, some of these, terephthalic acid, nitrophthalic acid, they're the same mass, so we don't know the exact position of all these things, but we have a pretty good idea what the structure of that is. So uh, the most important thing for, for uh, migration tests is a, a positive control. How much time have I got? Am I up? Oh, okay. So is, is, a, is a positive control for, uh, with mass balance. That means you got to put something in a migration test, hold it there for the 10 days, at 40 degrees C or <coughs> run it through 120 degrees C for two hours to make sure you really get what's there. And so for can coatings, this is what we did. We, we, had, to, we, we had to, you know, test these things because now they're coming on the market and our data stops here. And so if you take a polyester coating, which is, can be subject to hydrolysis, <coughs> um, we, we ran some tests in water and this amount here, that's out at one point five years we took these experiments out to, which is a pretty significant amount of time to, to set there. And you can see what you measure in our guidance document is not what you consume at the end of the shelf life of the can. So we're in the process now of thinking about how we can modify our guidance document to, to you know, take into, into account some of these things, because you see here, these grow with time. That means that something is, is, is undergoing hydrolysis and forming something new or more of it at the end of the shelf life. And these things are degrading. They're probably turning into these things depending on, uh, on what really happens. And so in order to adjust our guidance document, we need to do some food analysis, which that's in progress, to see how we might modify our guidance <clears throat> to uh, accommodate something like this can coatings, which are you know, on the shelf for many, many, many years. And we never, our original guidance never tested those. 
And so the conclusions, you know, actually to, to test uh, food packaging materials, really you need to calibrate your access you know, with proper standards or surrogates that represent something that, that you think is there. And migration tests really need to have positive controls at the expected concentrations, what you think. Don't put in, you know, 500 parts per million and, and do your tests that way because that's a lot different than trying to keep, you know, you know, a few parts per million or a few parts per billion around over the lifetime of your experiment. And with that, I'll take any, any questions anyone might have. Okay, since we're getting ready to go into our break, um, we'll take one question for Tim and then ask that you hold the rest until our panel discussion uh, later this morning. So, um, Tim, great presentation. Th those of us that are analytical chemists are really salivating. The, uh, so, in, are you doing this work at the FDA with the high resolution LCMS and other types of high resolution instruments? Are you requiring your submitters, your petitioners, to do that work for you and submit it with the chemistry recommendations? Well, okay, it's, it's the requirement of the submitter to do that. The high resolution instruments now are, are now becoming com common. So, the, so the, it can be done. Uh, but, but we, do, we are doing them ourselves there, you know, because we, we need to have the expertise to make a recommendation. And one recommendation I'm going to have for the updated guidance document is we put in something regarding high resolution mass spec on how you can come up with a, a formula that says, because a lot of these are unknown, you know, and, and, and till recently, you know, we would say, well, they all kind of look like this, you know, based on like a, an FTIR. And, and and everyone knows that that's not not acceptable in today's standard. 